Okay, here we go. Also, you're happy that we are at the, la at the last second chapter of the book, and we're almost done. And <laughs> yeah. She has? She has more, okay. Yep, I don't, I don't, I think this is enough. Okay, uh, so chapter nine. Um, so we'll um, learn a little bit about moving prophetically in praise and worship. Okay, moving uh, prophetically in praise and worship. Um, so this will be more in context with uh, singing, music, and, and all of that, okay? Um, prophetic worship, uh, what do you understand by that? Prophetic worship, it, it seems to be like the buzzword these days. Being led by the Spirit. Okay, chapter over. Let's go to chapter number 10. Okay. <laughs> it's like answers right there. Sorry? It's okay. Share it. Means? The, uh, I'm not able to follow. Oh, yeah, okay. So what is it? You finished? <laughs> why, why is he so shy? <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, cool, cool. Okay, so yeah, what is, what, what, what is your, what do you think uh, a prophetic worship? Uh, yeah, sure. Something that moves you, okay. Um, all right. There's a lot more follow-up questions to that, but then we'll move on. Yeah. Okay. Something that God talks to us during worship. Okay. Being led by the worship uh, spirit is one, uh, and something that moves us. Okay. What? Else? Sorry. Something about the future. Okay. That's being released. Like God's word is being released. Right. It reveals something. Okay. Anything? Sorry. Edifying and building. Okay, so prophetic worship edifies, builds us. Okay, yeah. Vima? Sorry, Nicola. Scriptures. Um, so what about it? So you, you get these scriptures. I like it, okay. A scripture, okay. Yeah, God will release, yeah. Sorry, one second, Vima. Yeah. 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 So what is the difference? Uh, there's a question. So what is the difference between prophetic worship and then worship that what we do, right, normally? Uh, so, OK. So the difference between like what you asked, just the regular worship, or the regular worship worship that we do, and then this prophetic worship, and there's an, there's an other word called spontaneous worship, right? So there's worship. There's prophetic worship, there's spontaneous worship, right? Um, so spontaneous is what? On the spot. That's what spontaneous worship is, right? Now, um, spontaneous worship can be prophetic worship. Okay? It can be prophetic worship, but not all spontaneous worship is prophetic. <clears throat> I'll say that again. Right? So pro spontaneous worship, it can be prophetic worship. But not all spontaneous worships are prophetic. Why do, what do I mean by that? I just said spontaneous means you've been put on the spot, isn't it? So it's like saying, right, uh, Sean, um, why don't you just lead us in worship right now? So what am I doing? I'm putting you on the spot, right? And so, OK, I'll take the guitar and I start leading. Uh, here I am to worship. Here I am to bow down. Right, so you're leading worship uh, on the spot. It, spontaneously, I asked you, and you're doing it. So, but here I am to worship is a well-known song. It is not spontaneous. Uh, prophetic worship, and nothing wrong with that, by the way. Right, what, everything what we're doing. Prophetic worship is that, um, like what we just shared. Right, you're leaning on uh, the Holy Spirit's leading. Maybe you're listening. You're, you know, saying, okay. 
he wants to release a particular word or a phrase or a melody right um and so you hear that and you sing it out and that is being that's being prophetic right uh if you take off the worship word part from prophetic right it just be prophetic isn't it like i'm not sure if you're uh doing a course on prophetic or but anyways so and i'm we're all praying supernatural hour what happens is that okay so there's a word of knowledge or a prophetic word that's being released right and so we sometimes we just say it saying okay i see this and i'm seeing this image right you're seeing a prophetic word you're getting a prophetic word or a prophetic image uh, but sometimes it when it can be a melody that you're hearing saying so you're lead, you're leading worship and uh and it could be a melody it could be an image uh it and then you take those words and then you put a melody into it and then you worship with it um so that's what prophetic worship is all about is we kind of complicated it over the years but it simply is listening to god's heart and releasing it and you're just being the vessel right um it's what he is saying in the here and the now because god will is is speaking i mean you never know that you know you, there's something that he wants us when god calls abraham he says um abraham go to the place that i will show you so in the beginning god didn't tell abraham everything abraham didn't get the big picture so when abraham obeyed when he came to the particular point god was like okay when you get there, i will show you where you have to go it's like that you know just leaning on what god has to say that basically is what prophetic worship is I and mean, we've kind of summed up the whole chapter basically but um but it's it's, it's powerful okay uh, we'll look at it a little bit more and the importance of it is the first answer that we got was um following the leading of the holy spirit right that that's that's one of the aspects of prophetic worship is following the leading of the holy spirit right um he is emmanuel he is with us he is god who is with us isn't it the holy spirit he leads us he guides us isn't it yes or no guys yeah um so the bible says when jesus was baptized um the holy spirit came in the form of a dove and it rested on him are you with me it came and it rested on him in the form of a dove right now imagine you we have say i have a dove on my shoulders yeah now the birds are very sensitive animals isn't it like dove and naturally are very sensitive like right? and so i have um the a dove on my shoulders and i don't want it to fly away yeah i'm not gonna jump and you know i mean if i do anything like that the bird's gonna fly away isn't it uh but every move i make right every word that i say my volume the intensity of how what i do will be keeping this bird in mind because i want it to stay are you with me and that's what prophetic worship is all about or living life prophetically is you being sensitive to the leading of the holy spirit you don't want him to go away you don't want to say something that will make him fly away you don't want to do something that will make him fly away i'm speaking figuratively right and so that's just being led by the holy spirit is um as simple as that okay so moving prophetically that's why this chapter is called moving prophetically is how we, how you want to move how you want to progress how you want to go forward is hitting the nail right on the head saying being sensitive to the holy spirit when we are sensitive to him everything is sorted <laughs> okay so uh, let's take a look at uh, a few things here we look at um, the music aspect in worship why is it why is that important and how music and worship is connected to the prophetic are you with me music worship and the prophetic let's say this together music worship and the prophetic okay so um Hebrew word one of the Hebrew words for praise is zamar right what does it mean it means to simply pluck the strings and to play an instrument right so that's a Hebrew word and that's a 
praise. That's one of the Hebrew words, of the seven Hebrew words, right? It's to play an instrument. It's to strum a, a, a guitar or a harp or whatnot, right? So Psalm 149, verse 3, um, I love it. It says, let them praise his name with dance. Isn't that cool that you can praise his name with a dance? Yes or no? <laughs> Right? Or oh, is it just me who's thinking it's amazing? Right? Let them praise his name with a dance. Let us let them sing praises to him with the timbrel and harp or tambourine and harp. In our modern day, it could be guitar, keyboard, cajon, whatever. Right? Praise him. Um, I, I've been in worship ministry for for all I can say almost 18, 20 years. And just worshiping him, praising him corporately, it still excites me. It, 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 it excites me so much. Just reading this verse again, I, I've read this verse every semester. I've read this verse, right? Uh, every every year when we go through this course, uh, but it just excites me. Let's let, like you know, and it should do the same for us, like for each and every one of us. When someone says, "Come, let's praise him, let's worship him," it's like yes, let's do this kind of a thing. It should excite you. That like. That song is bubbling. It's bubbling. You know that song? It's bubbling in my soul. I'm singing. I'm dancing. But Jesus made me whole. Nobody knows the song. Okay. <laughs> it's there in other languages also. No, I've heard it a lot in Tamil, and I think it's it's one Pentecostal song. It's like full sending it only. I forget that. I know I forgot. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so yeah, let's praise his name. Oh, actually, let's read that Psalm 149 verse 3 together loudly. Okay, we just read about corporate worship. Let's all read Psalm 149 verse 3. It's in your note. Uh, join us, guys. Okay, online. Ready? Ready? Let's go. Let them praise his name with the dance. Let them sing praises to him with the timbrel and ha. Okay, um, Psalm 150 verse 3 to 5. Let's read together. Ready? Go. Praise him with the sound of the trumpet. Praise him with lute and harp. Praise him with a timbrel and dance. Praise him with stringed instrument and flutes. Praise him with loud cymbals. Praise him with clashing cymbals. Heaven is going to be loud. Right? Um, right so there's a huge connection with music and worship. Uh, right when we when we use our instruments to worship him, praise him, our voice, your voice also is an instrument. Right? If you want to join a music college uh, and you, in, the, in the application form, there will be, okay, which instrument do you want to join for? You can choose guitar. You will also find voice. Um, so voice is also an instrument. There's a box inside. <laughs> okay. Uh, you know, and guys, we are a walking instrument. Like we have this melodic instrument and we have another rhythmic instrument here that's going d -d 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 right it's, it's awesome right? um so so we understand the importance of music in the context of this worship so uh look let's look at the notes it says so music is integral to praise and worship but we should not be overly dependent on it nor let music become a distraction from our focus on the lord okay um so it should not become a distraction uh from our focus on the lord um sometime last week some, someone asked me uh during worship um how do i uh i keep getting negative thoughts uh how do i tackle that how do i overcome negative thoughts during worship right does anybody get well, not just negative thoughts thoughts Yes? No thoughts, and nothing is coming, sir. Nothing. <laughs> okay, so, you know, and so it says, let not music be a distraction. And um, again, as a musician, it's a huge challenge for me. Okay, so uh, when you st as a musician, yeah, you know the chords and how it should work and how the chord progression should happen and whatnot. And uh, when you're in the congregation down and when you, when someone else is leading worship and the band is playing and if someone plays a wrong chord, I'm like, mm. thank you, Lord. 
<laughs> it's like, it's like, oh, it's, look at my my friends. They smile and it's like, God is good, <laughs> right? Um, so, and you immediately have to check your heart. It's like one that line that says, "Check yourself before you wreck yourself." Tapes, you know. Uh, you check your heart and say, "Okay, immediately recalibrate." Okay, who is this all about? You ask that question. Like, it's normal to have those thoughts. Like, it's normal to be. You know, it's like that's who we are. We are wired like that. Okay, uh, we are wired. It's we've developed this culture or this habit of uh, finding uh, faults. We are quick to finding faults, like, like because it's easy. Right? It's like dirt. You go outside, you'll find dirt everywhere, isn't it? Yes or no? Yeah? But you have to dig deep to find gold. Isn't it? And so, and that that's what, you know, uh, this is as, as much as whatever you're good at or whatever it is, when we come into this worship setting, uh, what are the challenges? You don't let music become a distraction, especially musicians. Uh, it's saying, okay, I know he's going off time, but it's about you. I'm going to focus on you. You guys with me? Yeah? OK. Cool. So music and the prophetic now. So we studied about music and worship from the Psalms. Now we look at music and the prophetic. OK? So First Samuel chapter 10, verse 5. First Samuel chapter 10, verse 5. This is uh, the context for this text is uh, Prophet Samuel, uh, after he has anointed Saul as king for the first time, uh, he's saying, it's in the notes, guys. So, after that, you shall come to the hill of God where the Philistine uh, garrison is. And it will happen when you have come there to the city that you will meet a group of prophets coming down from the high place with a stringed instrument, a tambourine, a flute, and a harp before them. And they will be prophesying. Okay. This is a perfect text for us to understand the prophetic and how music is connected to the prophetic. Okay, so who is saying this? Who is saying this? You you know, this school quiz, no, who said to whom? You remember that? School quiz, who said to whom? So <laughs> the quiz, who is saying to, to whom? First Samuel chapter 10, verse 5. Bolo. Prophet Samuel is telling to Saul when he's just been anointed. That's what's happening, right? But just think about the prophetic on the on Samuel. He's giving the details. That's just prophetic. Okay, it's not connected to music. Samuel is saying, Saul, and he's prophesying, by the way, saying, when you come to this place, you will be meeting so and so people who will be playing so and so instruments and who will be prophesying. So Samuel itself is prophesying. And he's prophesying about the people who will be prophesying with instruments. Isn't that amazing? It's like, wow. Um, so that's just a side note. So um, that's one verse. And the other verse there is 2 Kings chapter 3, verse 14 and 16. 2 Kings chapter 3, verse 14 and 16. Uh, can someone read it from your notes, please? Yeah, cool. Thank you. So um, Elisha is, again, the context here is Elisha is asking, bring me a musician. And it happened when the musician played. OK, everybody say it together. When the musician played. Say it again. When the musician played, that the hand of the Lord came upon him. And he said, thus says the Lord. Right? Yeah, thanks, guys. <laughs> OK, um, now again, just to reiterate, so Elisha is asking for a musician to come and to play an instrument. And when he did that, the hand of the Lord came upon Elisha and he releases a prophetic word. Yes? Yeah, right? So the, it is possible that when we play, prophetic is released. Having said that, prophetic is not released only when we play an instrument. Are you with me? 
But this is not to say you take the prophetic and put it inside this box and say, okay, this is the prophetic. Okay, only when you play an instrument, prophetic will be open. We're not putting it in a box, right? Uh, but God moves like that as well. Okay, so when you play an instrument, uh, it's really Judah shall plow. Remember that? Yeah, okay. So we just looked at music and worship. We looked at music and the prophetic. Right? Are you with me? Now, there's one place where all these three came together. It's one place where all of these three came together. Music, worship, and the prophetic. Kidder. Where? Where it came? We'll turn the page and we'll see. <laughs> okay. So all these three elements, music, the prophetic, and worship coming together in the tabernacle of David. Okay, with which David built and uh, and the worship that he established to be offered to the Lord. Okay. Uh, now, before we go into detail about understanding the tabernacle of David, background. Background is important, no? Context. Okay. So, uh, uh, what happened uh, in First Samuel chapter four? Uh, you can go to First Samuel chapter four if you if you want to. Just are you guys online? Are you doing okay? Nina, Krisha, Shiv Kumar, all okay? Give me a thumbs up. Or... Awesome, awesome, awesome. Thank you. Okay, so uh, quick uh, background, right? To uh, to the build-up towards David's tabernacle. So uh, 1 Samuel chapter 4. Now, you can read that whole chapter. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> uh, so the setting is um, there was a high priest called Eli. Eli. He had two sons who were bad boys, basically. Okay. Uh, they were doing things in the tem temple of God that you're not supposed to do. They were sleeping with women and, and all of that, all immorality things. So there was no intimate or relationship with God. Right. They were doing everything evil, bad boys. Um, and so what happens? Philistines attack Israel. The enemy is attacking Israel. And everybody is scared. They don't know what to do. And uh, somewhere in the history lesson, they've learned that, okay, in the past, uh, people took the Ark of the Covenant, went in the front, and they won the battle. Yes? And so the same thing what these guys are saying. It's like, okay, you know what? Let's bring the Ark of the Covenant back. Ark of the Covenant represented the presence of God. It's the throne of God here on earth, isn't it? And they, when they bought the Ark of the Covenant here, everybody was happy and whatnot. The enemy thinking, what is this shouts of joy? You know, uh, we, the enemy was scared. But they go into the battle, they lose big time. Are you with me? They thought that they can go into battle without any relationship with God by just doing what God did in the past. If we do this, God will do that. They thought it was a formula without personal relationship. They lost home. If you read that chapter, it says 30,000 men died. It's there, guys, in chapter 4. Okay. 30,000 Israelites died. And as if that was not enough, Ark of the Covenant was captured by the Philistines. And as if that was not enough, when Eli heard the news, that the Ark of the Covenant was captured, but when um, uh, towards the end of chapter four, the word used there is ikabod, means the glory has departed, the glory of God has gone. Okay, and so when he hears the news, Eli Eli falls down from the chair, he breaks his neck, and he dies. The daughter-in-law, Eli's daughter-in-law, she goes into labor, she gives birth to a child, she also dies, and names uh, the son ikabod. That means glory has departed. You see the tragedy of all of this, right? The Ark of the Covenant has been taken. It begins here, guys. The story is very important. And then, you know, um, let's now let's go to 2 Samuel chapter 6. Okay. 
Okay. So again, we're not going to read it. I asked you all to turn there just for your reference. Now, between 1 Samuel chapter 4 and 2 Samuel chapter 6, the timeline of the gap is about 70 years. Okay? 70, yeah. Okay? So Saul has become king. Listen very carefully. Ark has been captured. A lot of things has happened. Samuel comes into the picture. He anoints Saul as king. Saul is was a man of position. Okay? Listen to me very carefully. Saul was a man of position. That means when Saul disobeyed, right? Saul disobeyed God, right? That way, that's why God was upset with him. Uh, Saul was like, Samuel, I know I did wrong in the sight of Lord, but you know, just walk with me and come out of the tent so everybody else will look and see that God is still with me. What is he trying to do? He's trying to just show on the outside everything is okay, God is still there. Do we do that sometimes? To show like, okay, you know, God is with me. Nobody knows that I didn't read the Bible or I saw this last night. Are you guys with me? So Saul was a man of position. The Ark of the Covenant was not there during the time of Saul. Then David comes into the picture. But the first thing what he does, what he does, is it tells us that David was a man of presence and not position. The first thing that he does is, I'm going to bring the Ark of the Covenant back to where it belongs. Right? For so long, for so many years, they didn't feel the need to go after the presence of God. It took a man who is after God's own heart to bring the presence of God back to where it belongs. This is just a gist. We went through this. Okay, the timeline is 70 years. We went through 70 years worth of story in, say, five minutes. Okay, so this is the background of David's tabernacle. Right? And Psalm 132. Let's just quickly go to Psalm 132. I'm just reminded of that Psalm for now. Okay. Are you there? Psalm 132? Psalm 132, right? Verse 2 onwards. It says, He swore an oath to the Lord, that he is David, and made a vow to the mighty one of Jacob. Verse 3, I will not enter my house or go to my bed. I will not allow no sleep to my eyes. I will allow no sleep to my eyes, no slumber to my eyelids, till I find a place for the Lord, a dwelling for the mighty one of Jacob. You can almost feel David's burning heart for God's presence when you read those words, isn't it? Like I will not, I will not allow myself any rest until I find a resting place for my God. That is the huge background for David's tabernacle. And you can Real, uh, I think uh, you can read all about it in First First Chronicles chapter twenty-five. Um, <clears throat> so, if you go to the next page in your notes, uh, it talks about First Chronicles chapter twenty-five, verse one to eight. Um, I'm not going to go through that now. Uh, the whole thing, okay? Um, but the summary is at the bottom of that. There were two hundred and eighty-eight prophetic singers. Okay, uh, let's just read uh, verse 1, okay, uh, for, for our uh, benefit. Um, 1 Chronicles chapter 25, verse 1 to 8, it says, I moreover David and the captains of the army separated for the service some of the sons of Asaph, of Heman, and of Jerathan, who should prophesy, who should prophesy with harps, stringed instruments, and cymbals. And the number of the skilled men performing their service was 
two of the sons of Asaph. Okay, so you can just read this whole passage. It's it's brilliant. Okay, so they were set apart. Another translation says that they were set apart. Okay, for towards the ministry of prophesying. So the summary at the bottom says there were 288 prophetic singers, 4,000 musicians who ministered in the worship to God. It was big. It was extravagant, right? Uh, it was like a party, never-ending party, day and night. Okay, the singers and musicians took turns to minister to the Lord in continuous, 24/7, non-stop, day and night worship. There was a roster with lots being cast to decide the team and schedule. Amazing, isn't it? Like we have roster here. Who's going to lead in supernatural nice hour today, tomorrow? Today, Roshan is here, no problem. So, <laughs> uh, the musicians were skilled in their musical abilities. Right? They were skilled. That means they were really good at what they did. Okay, they were not amateurs. Okay, point four. There were leaders who were in charge of music and the songs that were to be sung. That means there were leaders in charge. It was prophetic in nature with prophecy integrated into their worship and music. They were prophetic worship leaders, Asaph, Heman, and Jerthan. Okay, and finally, the last point. There were prophetic songwriters or psalmists, both David and Asaph were psalmists. They would write songs and these would be incorporated in their worship and prayer. Okay, so all of this is what was happening in David's tabernacle. Um, all of these three elements that we discussed about music, worship, and the prophetic. Are you with me? Right? And then, uh, you know, it says in Amos chapter 9, verse 11 and 12, Amos chapter 9, verse 11 and 12, and then it's being recorded in Acts chapter 15, verse 13 and 18. James is saying, I will rebuild the tabernacle of David. Right? I will rebuild the tabernacle of David. It doesn't, it, it means not a physical building. It's, it's, it's called a movement, like a spiritual movement where okay, people will be hungry for my presence, uh, like day and there will be day and night worship moments. And that's happening all around the world today. This um, international house of prayer. I'm not sure if you've heard of it. I hop. Um, it has a 24 hours non-stop praise and worship thing. It started in 1999 in September, and it's still going on today. Um, they haven't stopped since September 1999. Um, and so, houses of prayers like that around the globe. That you know, uh, it's worshiping day and night, praying day and night. Uh, God is raising up a generation um, of Davids who will go after his presence. Right, guys? Are you with me? Okay. Um, uh, any questions so far? I don't know. This no. This is just a tabernacle. So what Solomon builds is a temple. So tabernacle is a tent of meeting. So a tent is temporary, isn't it? So a temple is permanent. Um, so yeah. You guys with me? Yes. Too much uh, content for one day. I've be honest guys <laughs> is this too much content for just one day if it is too much then we can pause and we can resume next week okay we'll just do one more one last section and we'll pause okay the prophetic word and its characteristics 
okay, the prophetic word and its characteristics. Um, so we just let's just pause and just very quickly a glance through everything that we've covered, at least in this chapter. Okay, we study about music and worship and the prophetic, and where all these three elements come together in one place is the David's tabernacle. Right? We went through the brief background history of David, what happened, uh, you know, just for us to understand a little bit. So this is where we are, and at the point where we say God is rebuilding the tabernacle of David in this generation, in this day and age, right? Um, Bible says, right, my house shall be called a house of prayer, isn't it? And that's God's desires. And you'll learn more about it next year when you study about this chapter called A Course on the Local Church. Um, how God's heart is all for his church and it's his idea and uh, his church, uh, his house will be called a house of prayer. And it's in that context we see that God rebuilding uh, the tabernacle of David. Okay, um, so that's where we are. And just to understand a little bit deeper about prophetic worship, uh, the prophetic word and its characteristics, that's the section we look at. Right? Prophecy is simply God speaking to man through man, most of the times, sometimes donkeys answer. Okay, uh, uh, prophecy is simply God speaking to man through man. The Father desires to speak to us, guys. I want you to underline that. Uh, I want you to underline that. Okay, it's the <laughs> you and I need to uh, understand. You were designed, we were designed to hear from God. Okay? He wants to speak to you. That's his heart. Okay? Uh, it's sometimes, most of the times, we live in this lie. Lie saying, okay, uh, I can't hear his voice. I, I, I think God doesn't want to speak to me. I think he's upset or angry with me or, you know, all of that. But let's get this solid into our hearts. Right? Let's drill it down and saying, our God, our Father, He desires to speak to you individually. He desires, He wants to speak to you. That is His heart for you because you and I, we were designed to hear from Him. So don't say, Ah, oh, He can't move in the prophet. I don't know what it is. Don't con stop confessing, saying that. That's a lie. You were designed to hear from him and release. Are you with me? Yeah? Okay. So our father desires to speak to us in the now, in our daily circumstances and situations. In our daily circumstances. And sometimes we treat God like he's our college warden, like who just gives uh, you know food, room, water. That's all. He's not interested in anything else. He is our father who is interested in every area of your life. Are you with me? right? And that's why he desires to speak. So we speak the heart and mind of God when we prophesy. You can underline that. We speak the heart and mind of God when we prophesy. Okay? The Holy Spirit communicates the heart and mind of God to our spirit. Underline that also. <laughs> the Holy Spirit communicates the heart and mind of God to our spirit. The important thing there is our spirit. Okay, he he's speaking to our inner man. Okay, most of the time that's what happens. And uh, when we try to hear from God, I think I've given this example before. Is uh, you know when I can't hear someone saying from the back, I was like, so what now, right? That we, we lean in, and sometimes when I can't hear God or during worship and I want to hear Him, I'm like, What are you saying? I try to, you know, I try to listen to Him in my physical ear. But here it says, The Holy Spirit speaks or He communicates to our spirit. Are you with me? Um, and so, I mean, this is a different topic altogether on how to build your spirit in terms of being sensitive to God. That's one semester or one day's topic. Okay, um, that's where fasting comes into the picture. When you fast, you are killing your flesh. You're saying no to the flesh, and your spirit man comes alive. 
right? So that's what's happening there, okay? So uh, like I said, it's a topic for another day. Um, so Holy Spirit communicates in many different ways. The first thing is an impression in our heart, an inner witness, uh, a flash of information in our spirit, a quickening of scriptures. Uh, Nickel said that, right? Scriptures. So prophetic is sometimes you might hear this scripture come into your heart. It's like you feel like, okay, let's go to Hosea chapter 2, verse 14. You feel that impression, right? Um, pictures. This happens uh, most of the times, at least. Uh, pictures, a word, a sentence, paragraph, um, a physical sensation. Uh, so, uh, and I've seen sometimes when um, some of them move in the prophetic. Uh, when in, in church, when we are uh, ministering in healing and deliverance, um, and I've seen um, uh, all of the associate pastors, right? Uh, they say, um, uh, "Does is anybody's left elbow paining?" For example, right? Because their their elbow will be paining, I, and they'll say, "Okay, I'm I'm feeling a pain, a sensation in my left elbow. Is there anyone here uh, whose left elbow is hurting?" That's you know a physical sensation right there, and there's so many examples like that. Pictures. Um, I think last time uh, there was a picture during supernatural hour. There was a picture of a sunrise. Uh, I know that can be that has to be translated, right? A picture of sunrise. Again, when you see an image, God also gives a translation, right? A picture of a sunrise is like a new beginning, a new day dawning, right? Are you with me? Um, so uh, has any of these things happened to any of you? Uh, no. And during a supernatural hour, uh, or anyone online, like is thing any of these uh, has happened uh, to you? You moved, you've gotten a word or sentence or a paragraph or a scripture. You, you guys know what I'm talking about? <clears throat> okay. Um, so these are some of the ways and how he communicates. And again, this is not to say it's just one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. The seven points are the only ways where he. Uh, speak. So with that, we'll uh, stop this session. Uh, we'll resume next week. Is that cool? Okay, so uh, yeah, I feel like it's just too much content for day one. So we'll pause here today and uh, we'll resume next week. All right. Thanks, guys. Thanks, everyone online for joining in. Um, I'll see you all next week.